We're in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which laboured with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow labourers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord alway, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And we're picking up from verse 11 today. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Verse 12 and 13. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Before we start looking at verse 11, let's look at the word abased. Abased. It means reduced to low estate, humbled, degraded. And degraded means lowered and reduced in value. An abasement means the act of humbling or bringing low, a state of depression, degradation, or humiliation. So abase means to reduce to lower state, to humble, degraded. And abound, which is the opposite, is to have or possessing great quantity to be copiously supplied as to abound with provisions to be in great plenty to be in great plenty and there's a great verse which uses um, this term Romans 5 Romans 5 Verse 20, Romans 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So there's much more grace for the sin. So, picking up from verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. You'll meet hardly anybody on earth that is content. Hardly anybody perhaps in your life you've ever met is content with what they have. I wonder if you are. Am I content with what we have? Not that I speak in respect of want. What do you want out of life? What do you want in life? What do you want in your job? 
in your family? What are you wanting for? Things? Materialistic things? Possessions? One of the reasons why people aren't content these days, of course, is because of the television. Because you're bombarded with advertisements all the time. Everywhere you go, there's advertising and marketing trying to create a need that you don't need, but they're trying to create something so that you go out and buy it and purchase it. And you don't need it, but you go and get it anyway. Because we're brainwashed, because we're like sheep. Talking to one guy in a big company once, he said to me that whatever we put out, John, he says, people buy. If we change the colour scheme, people buy the different colour scheme. If we change the lamp, people go out and buy the lamp. We're like sheep. We're dictated to by the marketing and the advertising. Not that I speak, Paul says, not that I speak in respect of want. What do you want? What about the deep things in life? What do you want? Do you want a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you want to get as close to him as possible? Do you want to understand this book, this amazing book, the word of God? Do you seek for holiness and purity in your life? What do you want? Or are you a superficial Christian? What do you want out of life? What have you achieved so far? with the life that you've been given. Have you wasted it? You're a steward. God gives you things to look after. You've been, you've been given the message of the gospel. It saved you. What are you doing with that message? Keeping it to yourself or spreading it all around? So what do you want from life? What are you seeking for? The mundane, the, the uh, materialistic or the spiritual. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Paul says, for I have learned. Learning comes from experience. For I have learned. What have you learned? In whatsoever state I am. Whatever state I am, Paul says, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, which we've just looked at, and I know how to abound, the opposite. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That verse, verse 13, has been taken out of context by the Pentecostals for years and years and years. They just harp on about that one verse. I can do all things through Christ that strengthen me, but put in its context you see where it's coming from. In life, whatever situation you are in, whatever you're going through, if you're close to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have a great relationship with him, you're walking godly in Christ Jesus. You ought to be like Paul and say, whatever state I'm in, therewith I shall be content. But one thing we're never content with is our relationship with the Lord. We want more and more and more and get deeper with him as, as every second of every day. So let's look at some verses, some great verses in respect of these verses from 11 to 13. I speak in respect of want, to be content, to be abased and to abound. Let's look at some great verses. Proverbs 30, we'll start there. Proverbs Chapter 30, <clears throat> verse 8 and 9. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain? Two fantastic verses. Remove far from me vanity and lies. I don't want vanity and lies. All is vanity according to Ecclesiastes and Solomon. We're looking at that at the moment. Remove from me things that are vain. Remove from me lies. Isn't it interesting, you know, they have all these magazines and one of them is called Vanity Fair. Because all this superficial you know, fluffy stuff in life 
People just want. People put, isn't it amazing as well, you know, you, even in regard to magazines, um, all these different magazines that just do like, you know, little text and loads of photographs of famous people, and the suckers out there just go and buy the photographs to see, to, see, to look at this stuff that they'll never have, and they can't, and they're always wanting this stuff, and they're, and they're looking at all these famous people. It's all vain and vanity. What's the point? What a superficial life you have if you go out and buy these kind of magazines to just look through and see things that you'll never have and, you know, it, it creates unrest and you're not content and you're just looking at other people's like, what's all that about? What a childish, superficial life. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. You don't want to be poor, you don't want to be rich. And yet if you ask most of the people out there on the street, if you could have one thing today, if you could be granted one thing today, what would you have? And loads of them would say, I just want money, I just want wealth. Because they think that is the answer to all their problems. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Convenience. Food that is convenient for me. You don't want lavish banquets. Food that is convenient for us. I'm a very basic eater. I could live on beans and toast. And chips. <laughs> but food that's convenient for us. I've been to some amazing places to eat through work and I've never really enjoyed them. The atmosphere is, you know, it's quite amazing. You see all these fantastic places, you know. We've, Don and I have um, eaten in art museums, you know, where the whole place has been taken over and a whole banquet's put there. And it's, it's rubbish. <laughs> you know, people love it, but not for us. They fly in the white asparagus just for the meal. Get a life. We can't wait to get home, get the beans open, chuck them on a piece of bread and... There you go. And a cup of tea to swill it down. <laughs> convenient food. That's all we want. Food that is convenient for us. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? In other words, again, you, you think it's just you. You fill your life with things and you have all the food that you want and you don't need the Lord. Some of the people, some of the hardest people to reach for the Lord are the rich because they think they've got it all made. They've got everything they need. They don't need the Lord. It is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. I've changed that around quite a bit, but you, you get the gist. Find it yourselves, I'm not going to give you all the answers. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. It's hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because he's got everything he wants. He doesn't need the Lord, he thinks. We met a guy who has a car that he spent £400,000 on. Four hundred grand for a car. You couldn't imagine it, spending that much money. What you could do with that money? And he drives it probably half an hour a day <laughs> to work and back. It's amazing what people put their emphasis on in life. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So you steal and they say, hey, he's a Christian and then you're like taking the name of God in vain. You're a bad ambassador. So you don't want to be poor. You don't want to be rich. You want to be smack bang in the middle. Just give me, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. So we thank God for the food. And every time we eat, we ought to thank God for what we have on our plates. Food that's convenient for us, fuel for the fire, then we get going again. And for dessert, chocolate buttons. <laughs> have a little bit of dessert there as well. That's food that's convenient for us. Convenient for me. 
Right, so, great verses those. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Matthew 6, Matthew 6, verse 11. Matthew 6, verse 11 which is the verse we just quoted. Give us this day our daily bread. So we're not looking long term. We're not building great empires and houses here. We've got our tent. We've pitched our tent. We're ready to move when the Lord calls us. Give us this day our daily bread. We're eating the food that's convenient for us for today. And when God calls us, we go to the next step, to the next place. So we're flexible for the Lord. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 8. (coughs) This is the passage I was talking to you about the other week. Deuteronomy 8, verse 10 to 20. Listen to this. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. So you thank God for everything you have in life, including the food you eat, the clothing on your back and the shelter over your head. Everything that you've been given is from the Lord. Anything that's good has come from God. Beware. There it is. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. So if you're eating, you're drinking, you've got your fantastic life ahead of you, you've got everything that you need, but you're forgetting God, beware. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built good, got, um, goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied then thine heart be lifted up pride you think you've done it yourself and now forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint who fed thee in the wilderness with manna which thy fathers knew not that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. And thou say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. They are now forgetting, what they, forgetting God for what they have, and they are saying, It's me that has done it. Beware. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. Didn't we talk about this the other week? You go out and get a job, God gives you the hands to get the job. The mind, if you're articulate, God has given you that gift. If you're strong, God has given you that strength. God has given you everything. Don't forget God. Every good thing, every gift and every perfect gift has come from heaven above, we're told in the book of James. For it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, and he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers, as it is this day. And it shall be, if thou do at all, and it shall be, if thou do at all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them, I testify against you this day, that ye shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. You have done nothing of yourselves. God has given you everything. We ought to be thankful for what God has given us. What a great chapter that is. Now turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Another one. Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 to 20. 
<clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, verse 1 to 20. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and righteous, just and right is he. They have corrupted themselves, their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. And that's what we are living in today. Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath brought, that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee, thy elders and they will tell thee. So many people forget, folks, where they have come from. They forget the good that they have had. They forget that it was God that gave it to them. Verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings, so the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. Butter of kine and milk of sheep with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat and thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. But Jeshurun waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxen fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. You see what's happened? He's had all this good stuff. He's had everything that he hasn't now, he stopped thanking God for it. And now he has grown thick, shall we say, in the context of this verse. And in the context of modern conversation today, he is thick because he is now denying God. And he's not remembering God. After being given all of this, he has forgotten God that has given it to him. And now he has, he has lightly esteemed the rock, capital R, the rock of his salvation. You know what happens? Some people get so materialistic, and the Christians I'm talking about here, that they, they lightly esteem the rock of their salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. They forget him, and they, and they, um, they just build up their wealth. And they now no longer thank God for it and they're no longer pouring their money into the gospel which perhaps once they did a couple of Christian companies that were started years ago the guy who started the companies used to tithe and pour the money into reaching the lost souls of this world but as he built up his empire his massive empire he started forgetting his God. And now generation after generation has come and gone. And his sons now who run these, this company, or these companies, have now forgotten God. Oh, it's big in the world's eyes, but he will get his comeuppance. Verse 16. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. Not only now do they, have they forgotten God, they are now following and racing and chasing after other gods. That's what money does for you. 
with abominations provoked them sorry provoked they him to anger now they are angering God they sacrificed unto devils not to God to gods whom they knew not to new gods that they that came newly up whom your fathers feared not of the rock that begat thee thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee and when the Lord saw it he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters and he said I will hide my face from them I will see what their ends shall be for they are a very froward generation children in whom is no faith don't you think that's an amazing passage for today? Don't you think that's speaking of today's generation? God has given us everything. What a great land we once were. And now this land, England, has forgotten God. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation. Children in whom is no faith. There's hardly any faith today, even in England. People don't want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. They have no interest in God. They have forgotten God. They have forgotten his word. What do we read in Isaiah this morning? Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read it. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read it. And this country has denied the book of the Lord. They've forgotten it. They don't even know where it is. And the church is following suit. They don't even know where it is. We are in the worst state that we have ever been in Christian England. What great two passages they are for today's world. Hosea. Hosea, after Daniel, Hosea 13, verse 4 to 6, Yet I am the Lord thy God, from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me, for there is no Saviour beside me. There is no Saviour beside God. There is no Saviour beside the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no other way and no God that can save you except the Lord Jesus Christ. I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. According to their pasture, so were they filled. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore have they forgotten me. They were filled. They had their fill and because they were filled they had no need of God and they forgot him when they were hungry. And that is why people are more responsive folks in third world countries when they are hungry and thirsty after, you know, when they haven't got the physical means and needs they are more hungry for God. And when you go and preach to folks like this they, are, they will be attentive they will be listening to the word of God. They will receive the word of God m- much better much better than this land will because it is full and this land has denied and forgotten God. Does that make sense? And that's what we're living in today. That's why it's so hard here because it's such a materialistic place. To to have all of these things, to have all your needs met and then for you to forget God is satanic. He has given you everything and you forget God and that is what this land has done. Psalm 62 Psalm 62 verse 8 and 10 Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery if, if riches increase. Set not your heart upon them. So we are to trust in God at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. He's everything we need. If you're struggling, pour out your heart to him. Trust in him at all times. Whatever you're going through, trust in him. 
I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, we read in verse 13. We're to trust in him at all times. And then he goes on to say, trust not in oppression and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. And may God grant that to all of us. If riches increase, we are not to set our heart upon them. If we get more money, we pour the money into the work of God. And that's how it goes. May we do that. If our riches increase... We will pour the extra money. We will pour everything that God wants us to pour in. That we, from our hearts, will pour into reaching others with the gospel. We will support more missionaries. We will help more people. If our riches increased. If our riches increase. We will not set our heart upon them. And God help us to do that. Luke 12, 15. Luke 12. Luke 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed, the Lord speaking, and beware of covetousness. For a man's life, what a verse this is, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. What a great verse that is. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. It's not what you've got. That's not what life's about. It's not what you've got. It's what you are in Christ that matters, that counts. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Hebrews 13, 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. Be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So be content with such such things as ye have. If you've got more than somebody else and they have a need, meet their need. Help them. Some of the tightest people I have ever met are Christians. And that is disgusting. That is terrible. That's an abomination. If we've got extra that we don't need, need, we ought to help others. Didn't we? If people are struggling, why aren't we helping them? Why aren't we pouring our works, you know, the the stuff that we have, our efforts, our finances, into channel it into a ministry, into a missionary, into somebody that is trying to reach the lost. You know, some people want to give out tracts, but they can't afford the tracts to give out. But they are willing to go and give them out. Shouldn't we supply those free of charge? We do, in a lot of cases. And we ought to, more. I don't like the idea that we have, you know, tens of thousands of tracts and books, etc., sitting there. Because it's doing no good. The rapture could happen any moment. We want to get it out. Have a quick, fast turnover of stock and get them out where people are reading them and give it to the tract distributors. I love what John Wesley did where he set, I think he paid tract distributors all over. I think it was London he changed. Because he had hundreds and hundreds of people that were giving out Christian literature. I love the idea of that. If I could afford that, I would love to do that. Here we go again. 2 Corinthians 6, 10. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You're content with your portion. Proverbs 16, 8. Proverbs 16. 
verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. It's amazing how you can have somebody who is so wealthy, so rich, and all they want to do is get more. They're addicted to business, and they're addicted to money, so that's all they live for. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Psalm 37, 16. Psalm 37, verse 16. A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. If you haven't got much, but you've got enough, and you're righteous and you're living for the Lord, you're in a better state than many riches that a rich man hath. Proverbs 15, 16. Proverbs 15. Sixteen. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. The more you have, the more trouble it brings. The more you have, the more possessions you have, the more hassle you have. The more money you have, the more hassle you have. The Bible warns us. It's brilliant. It warns us about these pitfalls. 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 8. What an amazing passage this is. But godliness with contentment, is great gain. What's great gain? Godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, and having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Food and clothing, be content. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. You ought to be. You ought to be satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. And the TV is doing that to man. Keeps bombarding him with what he needs to get to be in the latest fashions and trends. Fashions and trends. Clothing is to keep you warm. Isn't it? Is that what it's for? To keep you warm. Fashions and trends? Should we be chasing after the fashions of this world? And the trends of this world? Getting the latest... Gadgets and objects. The eyes of man are never satisfied. Are you satisfied this morning? Have you got everything you need? Ecclesiastes 6, 7. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. All the labour of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. You should have some good notes on that. Luke 3.14 There's so many verses. Luke 3.14 And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Are you content with your wages? That's what the Lord said. Matthew 6. Matthew 6, verse 31 to 33. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewith shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need of all these things. Ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first... The kingdom of God. That's the first thing you're to seek. And his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Seek God before anything. Seek God before anything. Not that I speak in respect of want. 
For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's what Paul said. That's what Paul wrote. Helping us, warning us, strengthening us. So shouldn't we have a different outlook perhaps on life that we have at this present time? Are we chasing things that we didn't ought to be chasing? Are we focusing on things that we didn't ought to focus upon? There's a difference between needs and wants. Are your needs met? What do you want? What do you want out of life? What do you really want out of life? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure this morning? Where is your heart this morning? If it's on the Lord, you're doing well. That's where it should be. If it isn't, you've got problems. Let's pray.